morning, everyone. I'm happy to see so many people after our exciting evening, right? So how did everybody sleep after? <laughs> My good friend, dear colleague, texted me, I feel so sorry for the people who have 8 a.m. talks, so that's me, dude. <laughs> Anyway, I just was grateful that I packed my good pajamas, so. <laughs> okay, so our, the title of our session today, is, it's a long one, bear with me, Strengthening American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Participation in Alzheimer's Disease Research. So um, I am the moderator, and as a moderator prerogative, I get to tell you about a few um, sort of high-level things that are happening and kind of exciting uh, developments in this area. So. Um, I want to just cover a, a few things. This is this conference. You guys, I'm preaching to the choir. We're changing how we think about recruitment. In fact, recruitment isn't really the important word in our discussions. It's about inclusion, and how do we achieve inclusion? We think about inclusion at all levels of involvement of our work. So. And this brings us to this idea of data sovereignty and as well as indigenize, indigenizing science. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about each of these. So have people heard about what's happening with data? Do people know the notion of data sovereignty? How many of you know that, that term? OK, this is, this is good. This is an informed audience. So it, when you are partnering with, uh, with tribal communities, you are partnering with a sovereign nation. When you, you go on to tribal lands, you are a guest in another nation. You don't have a passport, I know that, but you are indeed entering another nation. And, these, and the nations feel very strongly that the data is theirs. So it, data are, are sovereign property of that nation. And so what that means is you can't just waltz onto a tribe and start recruiting people. If, if you do, there's a tremendous risk for the safety of individuals who are contributing those data. So this is a culture clash between this sort of individualistic idea of like, I can consent to anything I want, where people are seen as part of a collective, I think, in more, more accurately in, with uh, indigenous uh, populations. So what's happening on the national level, so we are thinking proactively, my, my dear, dear colleagues, Dr. Uh, McLester Davis at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and Jordan Lewis at the University of Minnesota in Duluth, or Dr. Lewis, um, are leading or co-chairing an all-indigenous panel who are looking at ways to proactively protect data that are collected um, by centers and by other groups and developing policy that will guide the work we're doing. So thank goodness. I really am so grateful for the, the time that they put into this effort to really create a policy that is both moves the science as well as keeps data protected. So for those of you who are attending the fall meeting, there is a Indigenous ADRD Data Sovereignty Advisory Group meeting. It's invite only, so don't, uh, don't um, inundate Sarah Bieber with a uh, request to attend. If you are working with Indigenous populations, certainly that this is something that I recommend that you attend this to learn, to get an update on what's happening with the policy developments. So um, next I'll just briefly mention what's happening around indigenizing science. And actually, it, True story, I'd wish this would happen with all populations we work with, that they see the ownership. So I talked about how um, involving communities that we partner with at every single level, not just recruiting, or not just the recruitment teams. You know, we're all on board with that. We, we all recognize we need to hire people from the community to do recruitment. We need to actually make sure that the people leading this work are from those communities. I know that, I, I, I I know that I am a non-Hispanic, cisgender, white woman doing this work. I see myself as a placeholder, though. My personal goal is to make sure that we bring into this field people who are from these communities, and not in a way that we're tokenizing them. So John and I had several back and forth emails. I kept trying to get myself off the program. And he kept trying to keep me on the program, so we compromised, I moderated. So. Um, the, so again, we don't want to just tokenize people. Can we open doors in academia? And dear colleagues, can we pledge today to stop hazing? OK? We just because it was hard for us doesn't mean it has to be hard for the next generation. And there are ways that this space is made for people that look like me. So why can't we open doors and bring people in in ways that we lift up and support people? So the next time, Think about this. If you are telling your students, you are to this or you're to that, you just need to be different in this way. 
maybe what we need to do is ask the question if maybe the system needs to be different. You know that analogy of the pipeline? I don't really like the pipeline analogy anyway, but maybe this pipeline is so corrosive that it needs to be changed. So, agree with me? <laughs> Shameless a plug for applause, I know. So. Anyway, so it would be, well, someday I want to say that my students are succeeding because of what we are doing, not in spite of. So, that's my dream. So, it, let's open our doors of academia in ways that are truly welcoming. Okay, so with that, so thank you for my soapbox moment. So, and you all stayed awake, and, and most of you, a lot of you got to see me in my cute pajamas, so. Okay, so it's my, my pleasure now to um, introduce my dear, dear colleagues, um, Dedra Buchwald and Amanda Boyd. So for those of you who have done any work with indigenous populations or have read any literature about uh, what's happening with the brain um, for indigenous populations, you know Dedra Buchwald's work, you know her. Um, the Strong Heart Study, she was a pioneer in the field, leading this, this effort decades ago, and at the same time, like, it, it really educating us about data sovereignty. So she did this the right way, and she led the field. So she is a, a pioneer and a, a tremendous leader in this area, and really moved the needle in awareness around dementia and heart health in indigenous populations. So I'll let you read about her, uh, all her accolades, but you need to know the, uh, the other part of this that's not in the bio is how important she has been for the field. So, um, and my other dear colleague, again, you can read about her. Um, she's doing the coolest work, though. Don't you love that when people like, they, they are doing such cool work that you get excited about it? Um, she's looking at ways to really indigenize how we communicate about health and uh, health promotion in, in indigenous populations. So, so think about this. There's a, a tendency, I think, to sort of um, be patronizing as we look at, at indigenous ways of knowing. Like, isn't that quaint? Um, where actually what my dear colleague, Dr. Boyd, does is elevate it so that it stands on equal footing with, with a Western way of looking at medicine and health. So it, there's a, an expression coming out of our Australian colleagues' work called two-eyed seeing, where you really hold in the same space equal value for indigenous ways of knowing as well as Western medicine. And you take the best of both of these worlds. And, uh, and so I uh, applaud Amanda's work with the two-eyed seeing approach for health communication. So I, I think I've set the stage for these wonderful colleagues. So uh, I think the next step is for us to welcome to the podium, uh, Deidre, are you first? Okay, so join me in welcoming